Good morning. Good, <laughs> good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. It is now noon. That means it's the afternoon. And we, wel and we welcome you here to the co-auditorium at the McCracken Library at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. My name is Eric Rossboro. I'm associate librarian at the senior ca and senior cataloger at the McCracken Research Library. And we're ready, very proud to present another installment in the local lore series featuring Bob Richard. Today he's brought outside talent. Anyway, before we get started, I'd like to let you guys know that upcoming, our next talk is gonna be on June 9th, the tour of Yellowstone with Aubrey Haynes. John Lounsbury will join Bob for that talk. That will be June 9th on July 21, Cody Yellowstone, 150 years, August 18th the most scenic 72 miles, the road to Yellowstone. So you're not gonna wanna miss those talks. Anyway, today's talk is gonna be super great. It's gonna be about the question that everyone in Cody or has ever passed through Cody wonders about. Where is Buffalo Bill buried? And today Bob's not only done a ton of research, but he's also enlisted outside talent. We have Mike and Margie Johnson. Mike and Margie Johnson founded Cody Trolley Tours in 2001 and owned and operated the popular seasonal attraction through 2009. The one hour trolley tours shared a wealth of history about the town of Cody and its sites along with so stories about Buffalo Bill and his town in the Rockies, which is why we're bringing them in today. Bob Richard, if you don't know, is a lifelong Wyoming resident. His experiences are pure west. He worked at guest ranches, guided horse and hunting trips, ranched, and for 37 years owned and operated grub steak expeditions, amongst other things. Lately, Bob has taken a turn as an author. He's written several books. And after the talk today, he will be signing these books for people who would wish to get one up at the store upstairs. And we'd like to call your attention to this book here, Cody, the Man, the Town, and the Legend by Bob Richard. This is a book you're gonna want in your library after having this talk, so we look forward to seeing you upstairs to get a signed copy. And with that, oh, I, I would, I'd also like to thank Sam Hanna for his stellar help upstairs in the booth. I couldn't do it without him, nor could we do without Mac Frost, our, our AV man. Let's give a hand for Sam and Mac. All right, with that, I give you Bob Richard and Mike and Margie Johnson. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, Eric has been a big help to us. When I started this project, it didn't sound like it was going to be too difficult one a month. And now that I'm into the fifth month, I'm finding I'm having to do a lot more research to learn and understand what I'm talking about. I thought I knew a lot, but I've learned a whole lot more, as you will find out today. Uh, this has always stirred interest long before I was born, back into the early 20s, and I'm going to let Mac talk about that uh, towards the end of our presentation. But Mac has worked with me on each and every one of these talks. And he always has good input for his cousin. And uh, his grandfather and mine not only were partners, but they were also brother-in-laws. And somebody's calling me, and I forgot to turn off my phone. I'm forgetful, and I get calls from the doctor saying you have an appointment next week, and they make sure I get those one way or the other. I, my apologies. Anyway, this was a fun presentation. I've shared it with travel writers many times, uh, but not to the extent that we've done today. We've done research. Margie and Mike have done a lot more research, and they used it in their presentations on the trolley tours. And Mac did some research, 
In fact, we've been working on this for the last two weeks. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. And welcome and thank you for coming back today. I think we're ready. All I have to do is I have all these things in front of me to press and push. Margie said, we need to explain and show who the players are. I said, what players? She says, the important people in this story. This is Buffalo Bill. And his way of life still carries down to Cody, and we'll get into that more and more. Uh, this is Louisa, another important part of the story. Mary, Hannah, and she was called May, Cody, Bradford, Decker. Apparently she was married more than once. This is Mac's grandfather, Ned Frost. This is my granddad, Fred Richard. They were outfitters, guides, tour operators in Yellowstone. Come on in, there's some more chairs in here. We'd love to have you. This is John Vogel. We had to search to find young photographs of John Vogel and we found one. He is the mortician that was here in Cody and played an important part in uh, the story about Buffalo Bill. These two uh, were the Denver Post co-owners and publishers Uh, we've got two chairs down here, Al, right up front. Come on down. I have to say as Alan comes in that he led me astray many times as a young man. He was much older than I, but what a delight. <laughs> he has done tours with me, and once I gave him the mic, he took over and I could sit in the back. Uh, thank you for coming, Al. And I can and I can also say that when he was on the trolley, he did the same thing. <laughs> okay, uh, Mac, you're on to talk about these two. You said that you learned some things that really add to the story. Oh, they're there already. Yes. <laughs> okay, Mr. Bonfield's here on the uh, on the right had met Mr. Tammon at the Windsor Hotel in Denver. While Tammon was a bartender, he was also editor of the Great Divide Weekly newspaper, as well as a worker in a curio store, which I believe he later purchased and owned. In December 1899, Tammon and Bonfils were shot in their Denver Post office by W.W. W. Anderson, an attorney representing man-eater Alfred Packer, after a Post article had accused Anderson of taking Packer's life savings as a retainer. In the scuffle in the office, Bonfils was shot twice and Tammon three times. Anderson was tried three times, but never convicted, while Tammon and Bonfils were convicted for jury tampering in the third trial. <laughs> they, they did survive, yes. They went on to uh, great and wonderful things as yellow newspaper publishers. In 1900, both Bonfils and Tammon were horsewhipped and hospitalized by yet another lawyer who disliked their yellow journalism. Bonfils also took $250,000 hush money from Harry F. Sinclair in the Teapot Dome scandal. Bonfils and Tammon both justified their style of sensationalistic journalism as well as crediting the success as newspapermen with the quote, a dogfight on a Denver street is more important than a war in Europe. In 1902, Bonfils and Tammon founded the Floto Dog and Pony Show. The show was named after Otto Floto, the famous sports editor of the Denver Post, who was involved in the publicity work for the show. In 1906, when bareback writer Willie Sells joined the show, it was renamed the Sells Floto Circus. Bonvilles and Tammon owned the show until 1921 when it was the number, uh, one of the number of shows that were acquired by the American Circus Corporation. And I add that last part simply because after the Wild West show 
was, uh, was defunct, declared, declared bankruptcy, and went out of business, Buffalo Bill went to work for Sells Floto. He was uh, uh, a part of that uh, outfit for much of the remainder of his life. Why was that? He needed the money. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. All right, we'll keep going here on. Uh, this is the mayor of Denver that played a big part in this. And, of course, Cody's founding fathers with uh, in front uh, Buffalo Bill or William F. Cody and George Beck and Garens, Bleistein, and Alger in the back. And we're not actually sure if those are the men, but they were the, uh, they were the folks who, along with uh, uh, Beck and Cody, helped to found uh, Cody. Does anybody in this town, I'm sure Al does, know where Garens Avenue is? Yes. Okay, there's two people, three people that know where Garens Avenue is, named after one of the founding fathers. It's the little street that connects uh, 8th Street with Park Avenue. It goes in front of the Baptist Church right across the street from the Dairy Queen. It's only a block long. Thank you, Mac. Uh, this is a photograph of the people of Cody taken off the uh, balcony at the Irma. This is our museum that Mary Jester Allen helped pull together and put together. And that's an early day photograph. It hasn't changed too much. Has a lot more trees. And of course, Cedar Mountain there by the flagpole right at the top. And we're gonna talk about that more. The Shoshone Canyon and Rattlesnake. And Creek, it, or Rattlesnake Mountain. I believe it was supposed to be a replica or resembling his TE Ranch. That's correct. So it was the, even the building is honor of Buffalo Bill, and there was such an, a deep sense of loss when he died that everybody wanted to do things to to commemorate him. And building this chamber, building like this, and gathering up all the collection, his family instantly got on it. And of course, we all know about the Scout. I think it's one of the most photographed statues in the country and uh, uh, it hasn't changed much they've got some more information on the front of it today but it's still there uh, even though the uh, high school kids from Powell used to come up when we were in school and whitewash that Buffalo Bill and then we had to go clean it but that stopped thank goodness now, why don't you speak to this, uh, Margie? Uh, this I don't know anything about. The picture is a little deceiving. This building is a lot bigger than what it is. This is the the museum on top of Lookout Mountain, and these folks claim these folks claim that Buffalo Bill said that he wanted to be buried up there, and so they have a very nice museum. I went up there a long time, very early in our trolley life, and it was. It was um, close to my heart. Uh, when he had his ranch in Scouts Rest Ranch, and he had it for a long time in Nebraska, there was a young man that was a little kid growing up, and he kept coming over to Buffalo Bill's place. Now, some of you may know he had four children. He only had one son, little Kit Carson Cody, and he passed away at the age of five. And it was heartbreaking to that couple that they lost their only son. And so Johnny would come over and he'd hang out with Buffalo Bill and Buffalo Bill, you know, kept him going and, and taught him how to do all the rodeo stuff. And he followed him as he started his Wild West. So he's called his foster child, his adopted son. What's really cool here is that Johnny could not get back. Buffalo Bill gets sick and we'll go into that, but he couldn't make it back, but he was the one who started this whole thing. Johnny Baker, and it was practically almost family that did it. It's love. Who is Buffalo Bill? This is part a partial list, but what we put down as we were thinking about his involvement, and uh, he was known all over the world. Today, uh, or when I ran grub steak expeditions and tours, I had people from Europe that belonged to the Buffalo Bill Club in Germany 
and elsewhere before World War II. And I had a couple of old physicians that flew to Cody to see the real Buffalo Bill and the museum because of his membership in the club back in the 30s. Uh, so he reached far and wide. Also, just another thought, I was on R&R &R in Hong Kong at the Hong Kong Hilton with my uh, first mech and my crew chief, and we went to the Hilton because I got seasick aboard the carrier in the harbor. And we were there 10 days, and the first thing I found was the Buffalo Bill restaurant and I could go down there and eat my dinner every night, and they wheeled the prime rib in. And the first night, I had a big cut. After that, I learned I had to slow down and just have a small slice. But how nice to be in the middle of Asia, in Hong Kong, in the Buffalo Bill restaurant and bar. So he reached far and wide. Key events. Uh, his Wild West show went to Europe, uh, entertained Queen Victoria, the World's Fair. Uh, he started and invested in Cody, building a TE ranch to retire, Pahaska Teepee. Uh, he promoted going to Yellowstone, got the road built. Money became tight. He would invest in anything that sounded like it would help promote Cody in the area. Uh, he took loans from the Denver Post owners to store the Wild West show, and we'll get into more of that. Bill Cody died January 10th, 1917, at his sister's home in Denver. Why do people in Denver want him? Fame, tourist attraction, money comes to Denver. He is the most famous man in the world at the time, and he's still famous. People come here not only for Yellowstone, but they come here to Cody to learn more about this very famous man, Buffalo Bill. He was a friend of my grandparents on both sides. Bill Cody always hired Ned Frost and Fred Richard to do all the guiding of his European guests that came here. Lots and lots of stories, but he was a man that was a community builder, and his father was the same, and uh, lots and lots of history. And speaking of that, Jeremy Johnston, who is the historian here at the museum, who is recovering from cancer, and he was to join us, but he can't mix with the crowd because of his immunity problem right now, but he shares his best and uh, he was going to be here to add to the talk, and he could not be here. This is Buffalo Bill's last will in 1906. You probably will have trouble reading that. Do you want to touch on this, Mike? Yeah, this is his first will in 1906, and he waxes very lyrically about how badly he wanted to be buried on Cedar Mountain. It goes on for a couple of paragraphs. You can read it from where you're sitting, but he wanted to, uh, the, main, the main thing here is he wanted to be overlooking the town that he loved so much that he helped develop. Bob, go to the next slide. Here we go. <laughs> they don't write like this anymore, people. <laughs> I hereby direct that my body shall be buried in some suitable plot of ground on Cedar Mountain, overlooking the town of Cody, Wyoming. He also wanted erected over his grave a monument wrought from native redstone in the form of a mammoth buffalo and placed in such a position as to be visible from the town. We have not fulfilled his wish. He set aside $10,000 in this particular will in 1906 to get that done. A mammoth redstone that was visible from town, we're estimating has to be at least 20 or 30 times bigger than that buffalo that's up there today. You'll see a picture of that shortly. trying not to cry, <laughs> and I cried on almost every trolley tour. The thing is, 
Mike and I had the privilege to talk about Buffalo Bill and his town for nine years. We did over 2,000 tours and thousands and thousands of people. And our whole thing was to share this. And he gave us so much and his will. And I have a copy so that you folks, if anybody wants to look at it, it's, it's here. And it's pages and pages and pages. But the very first, it says, I want to pay all my bills. That was the first thing. But then the second part is where he wants to be buried. And he, he really waxed into it beautifully. So if you'd like to see that, it means a lot. He also was not getting along with Luisa at all during this will, 1906. He, <laughs> he redid his will in 1913. But in 1906, the last line, he, he didn't want her to have anything except the North Platte House. I make no further provision for her in my will. Well, on top of that, they were in the middle of a great big divorce in 2000, or 2000, in 1906. Uh, it was hot, heavy in the presses. It was a big deal. Nobody got divorced back then. So it was ugly. And this was his way of cutting her out. Ah, but wait, there's a second will. You know, it's really hard. We did not live back at this time. These folks did not tell us what they were thinking, but actions do speak louder than words. Buffalo Bill, he's in the middle of a divorce in, in 1906, and he puts his will together to show what the world what he's thinking. Well, great. The, the divorce is not approved, and he has to stay married to Louisa. He has built the Irma Hotel, and next to the Irma Hotel, he built a building to house the staff at the Irma Hotel. Everybody calls it Buffalo Bill's house. And it, that's what it was. It had a male set side on the right and a female on the left. The house was cut directly in half. So 2006 or 1906 comes along and the divorce doesn't go through. What happens? In 2010, all of a sudden, something does happen. He gets the staff out of that house and they open it up, and Buffalo Bill makes a house on the left side of that building for him and Louisa, and on the right side was for Irma and the family. So there are signs of a thaw, there are signs of them reconciling, and there are signs of them coming together as a family, because in the 2000s, or 2000, gosh, in 1906, everything went to Irma, everything, except a few thousand dollars here and there, but the bulk went to Irma. So things are changing, and it'd be really nice if we had had him here to tell us. Yes, sir. And, and it's up on, I think, Robertson Street and a, on the South Fork. And a nice young man who really has researched the history lives there, and he honors it. And, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful home, and he's trying to keep it the way it was. So in 1913, he turned everything over to Louisa. He issued the second will, which superseded the first one, says nothing else about where he wants to be buried, but puts his wife in charge of his estate, and she's to get everything upon his death. After his uh, death, uh, they had a big funeral in Denver, and we're going to go through a few slides. Uh, this is where the caisson arrived, and he was uh, there in the uh, Elks Club uh, for a period of time. Uh, I'm going too fast here. They had an open casket. It had a glass plate across, and the... Uh, uh, Elks Club officers are standing behind in this photograph. This is another shot. And Johnny Baker is the gentleman on the left, the foster son. This is the caisson headed to the state capitol. The crowds were immense. And uh, the line of mourners stretched uh, for three blocks. 
The other thing is it was published that more people attended this than any other funeral at the or showing at the state capitol, but including the Elks Club, over 25,000 people saw Buffalo Bill in state. Then at the Brown Palace, which became the breakfast meeting between Irma and the mayor and the publishers of the Denver Post, Oh, we didn't get that changed? Well, we we checked this twice and we missed it. But Louisa, not Irma. Irma's the daughter. But she agreed to meet uh, with these gentlemen and uh, have breakfast with them. Now, this is a photograph that I took uh, last fall, just before Christmas, when we were at the Brown Palace promoting Buffalo Bill, Yellowstone, and Cody to uh, uh, 42 travel riders from all over the world. And uh, you'll see that they're having what they call high noon tea, and all those are tables around there. And I can imagine Louisa sitting with these two or three people from the Denver Post and the mayor and they're trying to get Buffalo Bill to be buried down there. And of course, uh, as they were talking, the mayor said, I will give you $10,000 cash right now. And then uh, the publisher said, we'll give you another 10000 Now, Mac, you have something to add here. Well, if you use the... Uh inflation calculator and whatnot, $20,000 in 1917 equates to $491,000 in today's money. So it was a tidy sum. Anyway, great, great, she, in, great inducement. She took the money, put it in her uh, big purse, and they took her to the Union Station so she could make the train to come back to Cody. And she traveled back to Cody. Everybody knew she was coming with Bill. And they met across the way at the train station. Nobody opened the doors to the baggage car. They said, where's Bill? She said, I sold him. And he's going to be buried in Denver. Well, the citizens of Cody were very upset. And uh, they finally went home and they shut down the party they were going to have at the Irma, and Louisa went home, and she was kind of persona non grata in this community. But uh, that leads us along with part of the story here. Uh, these three men uh, are part of the uh, plot to steal Bill's body. This is, uh, this is Ned and Fred and the guy that prepped the dead. So anyway, you've got part of the players here. And John Vogel received a call from a ranch south of Cody that a, uh, one of the men had died out there. And he brought him to town and he said, John, will you take care of these remains and get him buried? And John Vogel said, sure. And the guy, the rancher said, here's $100. Will that take care of it? And John says, yeah, I can embalm him and get him buried for that. And uh, as John was going through the process, he trimmed up this gentleman's beard, and he says, you know, I think I could pass him off for Buffalo Bill. And he called Ned and Fred up at the ranch and said, men, we're going to Denver, and we're going to get Bill's body. Now, I wasn't there, but this is the story I heard from three, these three gentlemen as I was growing up as they talked about this. And they told the story about how uh, they did this, put it together. But anyway, Vogel had a uh, rubber bag that they put the cowboy in, the cadaver, iced it down, and the three of them left Cody. It took them two days to get to Denver. And we guessed at what roads, they were all dirt roads, but they drove down in Vogel's Packard, and uh, 
It took them two days to get all the way to Denver, but that gives you an idea. The road between Cody and Matitsi was a stage road, but it was pretty bad. And we figure they went to Grable, down to Whirlin, Thermopolis, uh, but kind of give you an idea. It was today's travel would take us about 10, 10 hours. Took them over two days. And they got to Denver, and the first thing they did is they went to Olinger's, where they knew Bill was in storage. They didn't have cooling, but they went in to see Olinger, and Vogel, of course, knew Olinger quite well, and they sat around his desk and talked, and finally got the point that Vogel says, well, we'd like to see Bill. And Olinger says, fine, well, he's downstairs in the basement under the stairs. That's the coolest place that we have. This is the front of the mortuary. This is a stairwell going downstairs. Mike? Yeah, that was me in the crypt room. I recommend it. <laughs> anyway, um, that's where Bill was in that center uh, box, and they pulled him out to look at him. Yep, that's Bill. Pushed him back in. You want to add anything else, Mark? Yeah, we had the opportunity. Margie talked her way in here. They closed this uh, more part of the mortuary in the year 2000. In 2002, we went down there. Margie talked us in there. We, <laughs> um, Bob uh, Hansberry was the mortician working there then. He gave us a tour. We were able to ask him everything and anything. He told us that they stored Buffalo Bill in the center square right next to the door in front of me there. Um, he said, now Buffalo Bill died on January 10th of 1917. It was eurythmic, uremic poisoning, which is kidney failure. He died at his sister May's house in Denver. That house still exists. It's a private residence. The Olinger Mortuary still stands, although it is today, it's called Linger's. They used the same sign and they just burned out the O. <laughs> and then it says mortuary under it. They changed it to eatuary. <laughs> and it's a mortuary themed restaurant. So it's still in business. Um, <laughs> but Bob, um, Bob, <laughs> Bob had some interesting comments. Um, since the age of 12, I've been a follower of the JFK assassination, so I'm into details and into these kind of questions. So I started asking all the creepy questions. Well, how's the body preservation back in 1917? And he said that it would be 95% looking like the same guy. He said back then they embalmed him once a week between January 10th and June 3rd when he was buried up on Lookout Mountain in Denver, supposedly. So his appearance, according to him, would have been, you know, very fine. Other people said he would, they embalmed him at May's house where he died, and he laid in state there for three days in the bedroom where he passed away in the living room of that house. Um, so in the crypt room, what I wanted to see when we went down there is I wanted to see is it possible for people to get in there and swipe the body. That's where I was down there. I wanted to see if this was possible. And uh, the mortician told me that the Olinger family slept above this crypt room upstairs, um, and they owned a dog. Yeah, that nice little detail. <laughs> um, Bob's story is he was, he was told that the door was left unlocked, so they could have gone right down there. And as you enter the building, you go into the lobby, and then to the right, you go down these stairs, and then here's this crypt room. It's not a far walk. It's right out the front of the door. Um, there's room in that room. I have other pictures of this crypt room if anyone wants to see them afterwards. But there's room to pull the casket out. There was no rollers on here, of course. The place was closed. That might have made some noise. They could have rearranged. Here's some of the obstacles they had to get over. They had to make the clothes fit. They'd have to take the clothes off one guy and put them on the other guy. Well, they had a mortician with them, John Vogel. He could arrange all this. If anything was off, he was there to to fix it. To me, one of the biggest obstacles is, is if they embalm them every week, the embalmer in Denver would notice maybe differences on that body. 
Is there, are the embalming marks the same? That's a, that's a hurdle that we have to get over in this particular story. But I think that's about it for right now, Bob. Okay, the men went back about midnight to Olinger's. Uh, this is Fred, Ned, and John. And they had gotten fresh ice for the rubber bag and they exchanged bodies. And then they headed to Cody, knowing full well they were probably going to be stopped, arrested for stealing a cadaver. They made it all the way back to Cody, never got stopped. And they went right to the Buffalo Bill barn. And they got horses and tools. And then they rode up Cedar Mountain. And according to my list of these old rascals, their comment was trying to dig in limestone rock and dig a hole deep enough to bury Bill was quite a challenge. But they got a shallow grave established and they laid Bill to rest there and covered it back up. And uh, they, they worked hard at it. And then they came back to town. And this is the inside of the barn. Uh, and I just kind of look at the tools and things around there and think of the time. And meanwhile, Ned, Fred, and John hit every bar and club in Cody, loudly commenting how Cody folk should go down to Denver and bring Bill's body back for burial on Cedar Mountain, never mentioning that he was already there. So it makes a pretty good story. They did this for three nights in a row, and then we have the documentation of over 100 cars headed south to Denver with three or four men in each car armed. And as soon as they all left town, John Vogel got on the phone and called Olinger and said, Cody people are coming down, they're armed to the teeth, and they're going to get Bill's body out of your mortuary. Well, of course, Olinger called the mayor, and the mayor said, well, we, we've made an offer on Lookout Mountain. We'll get him buried right now. And so they got a backhoe up there, an old uh, cable-type backhoe, and they dug a hole, and they brought, uh, set up the funeral arrangements for the burial, and uh, we'll keep going here. This is the road up on Lookout Mountain above Golden, Colorado. This is the open casket again at Lookout Mountain. There's some other lookalikes there. I guess they were trying to have lookalikes back in those days, too. But uh, he was very famous. And the police department from Denver uh, guarded the uh, casket. And they played taps. And this is, I'll let you talk about this, but before they did this, uh, the people in Denver poured concrete over the top of Bill's body and they sent the National Guard up to the Colorado-Wyoming border. And when the Cody folks got to the border, they were repelled, turned around, and went back to Cheyenne. When they got to Cheyenne, they called John Vogel and said, the Army stopped us. We couldn't get to Denver. And John says, fellas, you've done your job well. Come home. We're going to throw a big party. And uh, so they headed back home. And he told them, he says, we've already got his body up here. You did your job well. And uh, do you want to talk about this a little bit and how this, uh, where Buffalo Bill is and where Louisa is? Yeah, Louisa died four years later. And they put her in this same plot. And then they poured more concrete on top of her. So we always ended the trolley tour. We said, you know, if... Some people think that Louisa wanted to get even with Buffalo Bill because when she took money from those two guys from the Denver Post, she knew Buffalo Bill hated those two guys. In fact, he wrote a letter to a friend once said that he wanted to kill one of them in writing. So, And I'm just going to jump in. 
he hated these guys. He had been and he was the most famous man in the world. And we say that and you think, oh, that's a, that's a line that we're throwing out there. No, this was fact. He was the inter first international superstar. He, and then he also made that little girl next to him, Annie Oakley, right there with him. The, these guys were famous. And so you have the most famous guy in the world and these guys steal the body. What, what's going to happen? Cody, of course, is going to up and, and try to get it. And so I think his grandfather was very smart in this. But you've got all of this emotion that he's down in Denver, and he hated those Denver people because he went kind of broke. At the end, he was cash poor. He had a lot of land, a lot of investments, and a lot of stuff. But he was kind of cash broke. And so them offering Louisa the cash was the best thing they could have done, and she took it. That was the sad part. So here we have Buffalo Bill possibly have gotten stolen. Four years later, we've got Louisa dying. And what happened? Well, some, so some people think she did it to get even with them, that maybe they didn't reconcile as well as people said. And so the line that we always said was, well, if she did try to get even, and if they did switch those bodies, isn't it kind of the ultimate justice then that there's Louisa today buried under 20 tons of concrete on top of a stranger? We did have one co Denver City Council person that wasn't happy about that. <laughs> Absolutely not. They couldn't dig a hole deep enough. It was very shallow but they knew with putting the lime stone rocks over the top of him, it would be a, a good place. Uh, and I don't know that he's there. I've heard the stories, and I loved hearing them. But we have to finish the slides here before we go too far. But this I want Mike to talk about because they found this uh, as part of the uh, burial site where on Lookout Mountain. Well, they're very, very touchy about this up on Lookout Mountain. I mean, very touchy. Uh, Steve Friesen, the director there at the time, he put out a, a one-page handout. They'd obviously, at the museum, been asked about it so many times that he wrote, there were three questions, and it's on one page. Was Buffalo Bill really buried on Lookout Mountain? Yes, and then he tells why. Is Buffalo Bill still buried on Lookout Mountain? Yes, and he tells why. Did Buffalo Bill want to be buried on Lookout Mountain? Yes, and then he tells why. Extremely touchy about it. Because the Cody people did their job. <laughs> so they made it a point to say at rest here by his request. Our question is, well, who's his? You know, was it the Denver Post request? Was it Buffalo Bill's request? But by his request, they're trying to say that he was there. They also have a video presentation back in the day there at that museum on top of Lookout Mountain by his own request. They have a 15 minute video explaining that. And they have some names and everything's verbal. It's verbal history. And as we all know from verbal history, I think Forrest Fenn, a director here, he said that no history is accurate when only one person is telling it. Because <laughs> there's always multiple, multiple, multiple layers. Thank you, Mike. Now, you're looking up on Cedar Mountain, uh, where I like to think, uh, well, it's his chosen resting place. And this is taken from the Irma Hotel. Oops. But that We're on track. We're good. This, oh, yeah, help me. This is Buffalo Bill in 1909 taking the ladies of Cody uh, in February on horseback going up to Frost Cave and to the uh, top of Cedar Mountain. But can you imagine all the ladies of Cody going up to visit where he wanted to be buried and to visit Frost Cave? I mean, it's cold. That's winter. And yet he was sharing with the people of Cody 
what he loved most. This is one of our local reporters when I took him up there, and the gate's locked to get up where his burial site is. This is Ruffin Prevost uh, unlocking the gate. They do have a gate there, and you have to get permission to get through that gate because of all the high-powered antennas and that type thing. But uh, uh, you can get there, and uh, the owners are the TCT that has the uh, all the television and what have you and, uh, here in town, and uh, they now own the property. They bought it from EO Sourwine. And uh, hopefully he's going to, uh, the owner is going to take me up there. Or I will take him up there and show him where the burial site was and what what's going on up there. But it's it's a fun place to go up and visit. You can get halfway up the mountain without running into any gates. Uh, the BLM has not maintained the road well, and they should, but they don't want to. Uh, and I always push Let's get it graveled as well as they have out in the middle of Oregon Basin with 8 or 10 inches of good gravel. But when you go up there, you have to drive slowly with any vehicle, and it should be a four-wheel drive. But it's used a lot by all the uh, people that have their communications up there. And this is looking at where the towers are. This is the buffalo that Husky Oil... Uh, flew up there by helicopter in the 50s and had a place there. And he's getting pretty beat up. People shoot it. It's fiberglass. Uh, and it's not quite as big as it looks there. And that's Rattlesnake Mountain across the way. Uh, and then I was up there two years ago, and somebody carried whitewash and whitewashed it or painted it white with paint. And that's sad. Uh, I think that we need to get somebody or a group to do something about that. But anyway, uh, this gives you an idea of the size of the buffalo. Heart Mountain in the background and two of our prominent citizens, of Cody, uh, petting his nose. I'm not sure it's as soft as if they'd done up in Yellowstone, but they're still alive, so it's safe. Anyway, uh, Newton Lake down on the right-hand side, Trail Creek. This is the view looking up the North Fork, the Wapita Valley, uh, Logan Mountain, Jim Mountain, Trout Peak, and that's all part of the area that I grew up. This is a photograph that I found uh, of a young married couple and their father, Ned Frost, brought them up there. This is Jess Frost, uh, Mac's father, and his mother right after they got married and moved here. And Ned was showing them where Buffalo Bill chose to be bur buried. And he liked this spot because of the view both this way and towards Cody. And that's Jess and Polly Frost. Notice there's no houses in the center to the right of the lake. Uh, that was before we sold the ranch on Rattlesnake. This is Ned Frost. Uh, photographs are by Jack Richard. And that sign was stolen several times and replaced. For some reason, I got legs and walked off. We've never found one of them, but that's one of the original signs. This is Ned uh, in the 50s and telling stories, sharing. In the background on the left side of the sign is Jim Mountain, and back uh, on the back would be Rattles, or, uh, Logan Mountain and Trout Peak. And that's a close-up. This is when Eos Arline took us up to visit. And uh, notice the rock. Uh, let's see if I can point it out here. Got to find the right key. 
Right here is a rock and there's flowers on it. Some young lady put flowers and said, I bet that's the headstone for Buffalo Bill. Uh, and all of a sudden, all the sticks were being cleaned away. And I says, no, you got to leave it the way it is. And uh, you can tell who that was that was doing that, right, sitting to my right. And uh, so she put everything back to make it look more natural. But look at the grass, uh, and what a treat to be where Buffalo Bill could be buried. Uh, now, I have to get the right thing in my hand to make this thing work. That's looking at the town of Cody over the back of the buffalo. And uh, McCullough Peaks in the background. And what's behind that? But the Bighorn Mountains. How our town pays tribute. The Scout, Buffalo Bill Center of the West. Uh preserving the chamber building, which was the old Cody Museum, the Irma Hotel, Frost and Richard photographs in Park County Courthouse, Granny's elsewhere. We celebrate his birthday, the Wreath Lane uh, ceremony, Wolf Bill, uh, the statue with the child at the park, and uh, the statue of Buffalo Bill on the park bench becoming very popular. And these are just a few of the things. Uh, what gave us Buffalo Bill's personal local legacy, uh, things that he did, his establishment of different things, and he promoted Cody everywhere. Uh, and there's history surrounding all of us. Where do you think Buffalo Bill is buried? I'll tell you right now, I know his spirit is here. I'll guarantee you that. I feel it every day. I can't tell you where he's buried. And I've never said where he's buried because I wasn't there. But I had a granddad and an uncle and John Vogel that swore on a stack of Bibles. They knew where he was buried. But I'll tell you what, you can't walk anywhere in this town or around this community and not have Buffalo Bill spirit near you or a part of you. And from my point of view, we can't promote Cody and Buffalo Bill. We just need to promote it more and more. Uh, I think it's something that is part of our legacy. And I know from hearing my mother talk about sitting on Bill Cody's lap as a young girl and my granddad guiding and taking all of his men and horses and taking the Prince of Monaco uh, on a three-week hunting trip. All kinds of stories. But I think his spirit's here, and it's going to stay here with us. And Lookout Mountain can have that old cowboy with Louisa down there, and we'll keep him up here. I think that's just about the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mac. All right. Mac has one. Test, test. Uh, Mac has one thing he wants to read you, and then we'll have time for questions. Well, this is from uh, an online uh, blog and everything like that. Um, it's campfire chats, and it comes from the Buffalo Bill Museum and Grave, and it's written by the aforementioned Steve Friesen, the curator of said Buffalo Bill Museum and Grave on Lookout Mountain. Uh, few burial spots have been marked by the controversy that has surrounded Buffalo Bill's resting place on Lookout Mountain. As early as the 1920s, there were accusations that Buffalo Bill's widow had taken a bribe to bury her husband on Lookout Mountain. And as late as 2000, one gentleman <laughs> claimed that his grandfather had stolen Cody's body from the mortuary and buried it in an unmarked grave in Cody, Wyoming. Although totally bogus, according to Steve Friesen, this claim has been embraced by some people in Cody. The simple act of burying someone 100 years ago continues to spark controversy. All right. Thank well, you, Matt. I was up in the booth with Sam while this talk was going on, and I said, all right, listen, what are you doing on Saturday morning? 
We're going to head up to Cedar, so if you want to join us, we're going to go up and look for Buffalo Bill's grave. With that, do we have any questions? <laughs> we're going to bring uh, supplies for three or four weeks. We're not, we're, the, we're, the Forest Fen treasure has now been replaced by the Buffalo Bill grave site on Cedar. So get your metal detector. All right. Any questions? No questions? Listen, um, up, Bob and I are going to be headed up to the store, and we're going to be signing books, or he's going to be signing books. We've got this awesome book here, Cody, The Man, The Town, and The Legend. This will be a great addition to your library. All righty. Can I just say one last thing? Yes. It's nice to see the interest, because Buffalo Bill, we all live in his shadow. I mean, we... You can talk about the, the name Cody and everything, but seriously, folks, what he did to get this town going. The other guys were the builders and the, the on the ground legs, boots on the ground. But Buffalo Bill had the imagination and the creativity to get this place started. And it's the creativity of the people that really sparks how great Cody is today. And I'm gonna leave this out, this will, it says what he would have liked to have had. You know, he wanted it to be like Cheyenne, only better. You know, when you come into the Cheyenne area and there's those things, metal things up on the, the cliffs and you go in and you go, oh, okay, I know where I am. He wanted a buffalo big enough so when you were coming to his town, you would know you were in Cody by Buffalo Bill. And it would be really nice, don't you think, if we ever got a real buffalo up there that we could see from the ground instead of having to have a spotting scope. We, we, I think we owe him that. Thank you very much. We'll and see you upstairs. Next.